um, during our combination product summit in 2016 at Xavier University, we went through a way to determine a holistic risk profile for a combination product where you look at the drug component and the device component separately and then look at the aggregate to see the total risk profile for your product. And we were recently asked if we could go through again how that assessment is done. So we are recording this video so you have it on file. You can refer back to it. And it really can be used, as you'll be able to see, it can be used across the whole gamut of, of different aspects of any product that you have. It doesn't just have to be combination products. But um, what we're going to look at today is the use of a heat map. And the heat map is just one tool that you can use for this type of aggregation. Um, there are a lot of different tools. So find one that works for you, that you really like, and it's helpful to your organization. Um, but if you don't have anything, here's a good way to get started. And what you'll find is when you aggregate the data, the, the real key is to make sure you understand all the data that's under it that led up to that aggregation, all the, the different components, the different data points that led to what you're looking at at a higher level. So what are the benefits of, benefits of heat maps? So first of all, as I was just mentioning, it, it really is a high-level view. And it's a comparative way to look at risks across a, a number of different things. And so today we're going to look at how to compare the drug component risk of a combination product versus the device component risk of that combination product. So the heat map really gives you that total risk. Um, assessment over time is, is key no matter what you're doing. So with heat maps as well, you want to look at a point in time and then at a, at a certain point in the future, look at it again to see what the change is. And then that will help you understand where you should be focusing your time and attention. Um, as I mentioned, um, as far as the, the data that's underneath it, the, the aggregation that leads to the heat map is basically rolled up from a detailed risk analysis. And there are multiple sources of input. And when you look at it from a high-level view, a lot of times this is useful for like a, a senior management review or um, some type of a, a senior level review and understanding how to drill down to what is the root cause of why that data point is where it is on the heat map. And then again, if you look at it over time, why it moved. So being able to drill down to the data that's underneath the heat map is important. And, and really what you want at the end of the day is for this to inform your decisions and to help trigger action. So, so having that heat map um, gives you that, that high level visibility to see what's going on but then you really have to drill down in a way that will um, drive action. So this is you know, just to show you what a heat map looks like. And what we're going to do today is, is um, uh, basically map our device uh, component on the, the y-axis and the drug component on the x-axis. And then where they intersect is the, the risk of your combination product. So this is what it's going to look like at the end. Just wanted to give you a view at the beginning, um, just kind of giving you that end in mind. So today's analysis, we're going to have a fictitious product. So Best Ever Company has the following configuration on the market for the Block UV combination product. It's an injectable liquid vial configuration, weekly dosage, and it is administered by a healthcare professional. So that's the product we're going to be looking at today. There are multiple steps in setting up the heat map, and I'm going to walk you through each one and how to do the calculations. And again, this will be a great tool for you to come back and, and review as you do this in your own company. So the first step is to determine which indicators to include per axis. So for example, as I mentioned, um, if the drug component is our x-axis, what are we going to be looking at related to that drug component? So what are the indicators that we're going to measure to roll into the risk profile for the drug component? And then certainly doing the same thing on the y-axis for the device. Then you have to determine the importance rating of each indicator. So for example, if you're looking at a scrap rate um, and also recall, you might want to say that the recalls carrier, carry a heavier weighting factor or are more critical than the scrap rate. Um, so it's, it's just a way of, of indicating which one is more important um, throughout the, the indicators that you're looking at. Then you're going to look at the historical range of data for each of those indicators, and you're going to create an index of each indicator scaling that historical data from 0 to 100. So you're going to basically normalize it uh, from 0 to 100 per indicator for each of the axes. Don't worry, as I said, we're going to go through each of these calculations. 
You're going to then look at the current data to be assessed for each indicator. And then based on the historical ranges and the current data, you're going to be able to set up an index and then have an index score for that current data. You're going to multiply the index score for each indicator by its importance rating. And so then that way it, it really puts everything into context. And then basically at the end you sum all of the index scores for each axis to get the risk score for each of the two components. And so that's how um, you, you determine what the, um, the overall risk is for that axis. So again, we're going to go through each of these steps step by step. So as I said, step one is you're going to identify the indicators for the x-axis, which in our example was the drug component. And so let's say we look at scrap rate, product failures, process capability, cost of failure, cycle time, critical complaints, major complaints, recalls, and adverse events. So those are the indicators that we've decided to look at to roll into the x-axis. And of course, you're measuring a whole bunch of other things, but this is where we're going to look at for the risk profile for the drug. Okay, so then um, one thing I want to point out is that in all of the cases for the indicators, having a lower uh, score is better. So fewer scraps, uh, fewer product failures, et cetera. The only one that's different is process capability. You want your process capability to be high. So I'm going to, we put this in here to purposely show you how to handle that. Okay, so the importance rating is step two. So each indicator is assigned a weighted importance rating to ensure resources are dedicated to the true areas of risk. So for example, you might have a low risk issue, but since it happens all the time, that increases its impact. You might have a high risk issue, but there's no history of its occurrence with the product in question and a very low likelihood of its occurrence. So there's these kinds of things that you need to fold into your thinking when you're deciding what is the importance rating of that indicator. And the sum of all of those, so the sum of the ones that I just showed you on the previous slide, the importance ratings have to total up to 100. So here's an example. We just decided that the scrap rate had an importance rating of 5, product failure 10, process capability 5, cost of failure 5, cycle time 5, critical complaints 15, major complaints 10, recalls 30, adverse events 15. That's just the way we did it. We highly recommend that you do this with a cross-functional team. Don't just have a couple people from one functional area go into a room and decide all of this. Really get a, a wide perspective on, on how you do this. And then you're going to want to come back and revisit this uh, for everything that we're talking about today um, at some frequency to make sure that the assumptions you had and the decisions you made are still valid based on what you are experiencing with your product. So step three was to look at what are the historical ranges. So that's just a matter of looking at what they are. Look it up. Um, uh, see what the data has been over time for each of these indicators. And so we just put in some fictitious historical ranges for our product. Okay, the current data. Again, we just plugged in some fictitious data. But what is the current data um, that, that you have today for each of those indicators? Okay, so let's take a look at our scrap rate, and we are going to, in the next step, convert that to an index score. So we're going to show you how to do that. So you need to standardize the data in order to compare the various outputs of the indicators. So in order to standardize them, you basically create an index. Um, so step one is to take a look at the, the scrap rate range from the historical data, and from the previous slide, it was from, it was from 7 to 32%. Now you need to, for that range, assign a score of 0 to 100. So the way you do that is you say, okay, 7 was our lowest, and in, that, in the case of scrap rate, you want a low number, low 0 would be ideal, um, but let's say you know, our, our historical range has been 7%, so the index score for 7% or anything below it is 0. Now in our um, data for the historical range, 32% was the highest we ever had, so you assign that an index score of 100. So now every other point in the historical range is then linearly calculated on the 0 to 100 scale. And I'll show you on the next slide how you do that. So in order to establish the index score for all the data points in between, so up above we we're showing again that the scrap rate of 7% is 0, the scrap rate of 32% is 100 based on our, on our historical ranges. So now for everything in between, what you do is you take the actual data point, 
minus the best case, and the best case in this example is 7%. That's the best we had ever had. And then you look at the difference between your best case and worst case, which in this case is 32 minus 7. So um, the, the a scrap rate of 19.5%, for example, would be 19.5 minus 7 divided by 32 minus 7 times 100. That equals 50, so that is the midpoint of our index score. So looking up above, 7% is 0, 19.5% is now 50, and 32% is 100. But if you look at the actual data from our table, we had a, a, the current data was 30, so you would say 30 minus 7 divided by 32 minus 7 times 100 is 92. Okay, so then you would do that for every other data point in, in between the, the 7 and 32%. So going back to our table, what you can see then is for scrap rate, the current data was 30, so our index score is 92, just as we showed you on the previous slide. You then do that for all of the other um, indicators that we have on the left-hand column. So now for the example of process capability, if you remember, we said that a higher score was better. So you have to flip the risk scoring since um, higher is better. So a 98% in this case is 0, and a 93% is 100. So let's take a look at that. Um, and, and also I should mention that for any of these, you could, you could basically just plug in a fixed score. So let's say for recalls, no matter what, if you just have even one, that that um, gives you an index score of, of, of 100. So taking a look at um, how to calculate the index score for process capability, again, since a higher number for process capability is better, then in the index you set it up so that the 98%, which is the higher score, is zero because it's your lowest risk. So this is completely opposite of what we just did for scrap rate, where the higher number um, was actually the, the higher risk. So the higher number in process capability is your least risk, and so you give that an index score of zero. Again, this is our historical range uh, for process capability for our fictitious product. Um, then the process capability of 93% or more um, uh, is 100. So the, the index score for that is 100. That's our highest risk. So then you calculate the index score for all other values in the historical range as follows. You take, again, um, uh, but you're going to notice that the, the order is switched. So in this case, it's the best case minus actual data divided by the best case minus worst case. So looking at this, it's 98 minus our actual data divided by 98 minus 3. So our actual data from the table was 97.8. That's our current data. That column that said current data. So 98 minus 97.8 divided by the, the range, the historical range, 98 minus 93 times 100 equals 4. So when we go back to our table, that's where you can see in red the process capability index score was 4. Okay, so the next step in this is to look at the, the um, final score for the drug component. The way you calculate the final score is first you do it for each of the, the indicators. So the final score for scrap rate, for example, you take the index score times the importance rating, so your weighted factor. So it's going to be 92 times 5% equals uh, 4.6. And so then you do that for each of the individual indicators, and then you total the, all, all of those scores in that far right-hand column, and now it shows you that your total risk for the drug component is 83.75. All right, easy enough, right? <laughs> Obviously a lot of steps, but you can see the importance of making sure that you do a lot of those steps where you're normalizing the data across 0 to 100 percent um, so that when you look at one versus another, it, they're all standardized. And then um, also the weighting factor is critical. And that's why as you go over time, you want to make sure that that weighting factor that you had given those indicators initially still holds true today. So you want to make sure your assumptions from uh, the first time you did this are still valid today. And if not, again, with a cross-functional team, you look at those and reassess what should it be based on the more experience you have now with your product. So now it's your turn. So we need to determine the y-axis for the device component. So I've plugged in a lot of the information. So we're going to go with the indicators on the left-hand column. They could, be, they could be very different than what we did for the, the drug component. So it could be something that's more critical for a device than what you would look at for a drug. In our case, we just used the same indicators. 
Um, we plugged in the importance ratings that you see there. We came up with historical data for our device component. We have um, fictitious current data for you. And as you can see below um, in the, the index score, we calculated some of those, but now you need to calculate the index score for the top three indicators. So go ahead and, and do that. And when you do, you'll see that the, the index scores are 75, 88, and 100. So the next step is to calculate the final score for the top three indicators. We've plugged in the numbers down below. So if you go ahead and do that, again, it's going to be the index score times the importance rating percentage. And that gives you the following data. Okay, obviously you can go back to the previous slides to remind yourself how to do any of these calculations. But when you add up the far right-hand column, then it shows you that the total risk for the device component is 67.0%. So what we do if we now go to that heat map that I showed you at the very beginning, and we map this. So the device score, um, uh, the device risk score, if you remember, was from the, just the previous slide was 67. The drug score from earlier was 83.75. So the bright yellow dot shows you where that that maps. Um, so when you look at this in the quadrants, you can see that you know it's kind of up in the, the higher risk area. Um, and let's say you have multiple combination products and you're putting those on this same heat map, you can see how they compare to each other. And it, it should be comparative because you've, you've done all of the steps in establishing the weighting factors and the normalization and, and um, all those important steps that allow you now to pretty much compare apples to apples. So again, if you remember though, we said we want to inform decisions and trigger action. So let's divide this up into quadrants and you can see, well, maybe we should focus our, our attention on that upper right-hand quadrant and see what's going on with those products. Um, and then also, as we mentioned, you wanna look at this over time. So now six months later, you see some shifts in some cases, in some cases not. They're, they're where they were six months ago. Um, but when you're looking at this for from a senior level, uh, decision process, you want to not only understand what's going on with your high-risk products well, or even with products that have moved into a higher risk category, but what about those products that are either they're always low risk, they have always been low risk, or the ones that have moved to lower risk? What can you learn from what occurred there so you can apply it to your other products? Possibly, maybe not, but possibly you could. So again, the goal of this, no matter what you're doing, is to be able to make more informed decisions so that you're right first time next time you can fold it back in through an enterprise-wide feedback loop to from what you're learning to the next products coming through the next products that are being developed so that you're set up for success in the future so just a summary of those benefits again it's a high level view to, that gives you a comparative analysis of risks um, you have uh, an x-axis that you can define and in our case since we're doing a combination product we chose you know drug components and device components and then the heat map was, therefore, the total risk of the combination product. Um, you want to do that assessment over time, um, and you can it quickly identify uh, changes that are occurring. And again, we talked about the changes that are high risk and ones that are moving to lower risk and, and looking at learning opportunities. And again, it's created from that rolled up detailed risk analysis. You couldn't know the aggregation without knowing all the data underneath it. So don't lose sight of the data underneath it and remember it's there to help you understand what you're seeing at that higher aggregated level. And that will allow you for a drill down of the why behind the data. So I'd like to just thank you for, for joining us for this session. I was glad that we were asked to provide this again. It was very popular at the Combination Product Summit um, since it really is a very useful tool. Um, but it, you know, for those of you who are joining us for this for the first time for this recording, um, consider joining FDA and your colleagues in some of the industry-wide initiatives that we lead through Xavier Health. And our mission is inspiring collaboration, leading innovation, and making a difference. So please join us to help make a difference across the industry and to be part of shaping the future with us.